Welcome to the Macmillan Report. I'm Marilyn Wilkshire, host, and our guest is Michael Reed Hurtado, the Coca-Cola World Fund Faculty Fellow at Yale and Senior Lecturer of Latin American Studies. He is a Colombian U.S. journalist and lawyer with more than 20 years of experience in the field of Latin American human rights. Today we talk with him about transitional justice in Colombia. Welcome. Thank you, Marilyn. It's great to be here. Let's start with a bit of context about what it's like in Colombia today. Well, Colombia is a, a nice little black box of contradictions. It's a middle-income country um, of about 48 million people. Um, its GDP is surrounding $378 billion. That's roughly $7,500 uh, per capita. Uh, it has a booming economy, um, principally now concentrating on mining and the electric sector. Its institutions are relatively strong. Within Latin America, it's known as one of the most stable democracies. Now, to the other side, it's also been a country that has faced armed conflict um, on a perpetual basis and extreme violence. Uh, for the period of the ending of the 40s and 50s, we lived a, a time when, when it's even known historically as the violence with a capital V. Uh, liberals and conservatives just killed each other. There was a lot of intimate violence, a lot of very expressive and uh, grotesque uh, violence amongst families and uh, um, along those party lines. After that time, there was a uh, sharing of power between liberals and conservatives um, until finally in the early 70s, we went back to the regular uh, democratic elections. Since that time, there's been uninterrupted democratic elections. The institutions just get stronger. Uh, after a 1991 constitution um, reform and a new constitution, new institutions came to life that uh, even though we're in the middle of conflict that, that has not stopped since the 60s, we have a constitutional court that presents uh, amazing decisions that are heralded as, as you know, earth-breaking and, and news-breaking throughout mm -hmm. the world. Great liberal uh, legal tradition, uh, very, very sophisticated constitutional rights, uh, balancing tests go on. However, if you look at life in Colombia, uh, once you get out of the urban centers, once you get out of Bogotá, out of Medellín, these are all cities that Bogotá is an 8 million people city. Medellín is more around the 2 million per uh, person city. Cali is also around that size. Bucaramanga is a little bit smaller. We're, we're full of these middle-sized cities or large mm -hmm. cities. But once you get out of that, you get to rural Colombia, and that's where the conflict really, really hits. Uh, polarization of society is, is intense. Um, everybody's suspected of being an enemy, and violence is also incredible. Uh, with those 48 million people, we can say that there's about 6 million people that have been officially recognized as victims of the conflict. So as you can tell, it's a, it's a great contradiction. Yes, it's it's actually quite a dichotomy between the urban life and rural life and I guess my question would be why do not the people who live in the rural areas move into the cities to get away from that? Well, there's been an um, actual lot of movement voluntary uh -huh. since the 1970s and where the country roughly stood in a balance of uh, I believe 40 percent individuals living in urban life and 60 percent living in more rural type like over the decades, that has completely inverted. And today we have a population that's 70% urban and 30%. Now that has not all been voluntary migration. In fact, that period of the violence and afterwards the, the ongoing conflict, the action by both illegal armed actors as well as uh, the armed forces have led to a lot of forced displacement. Mm -hmm. Though there's a lot of um, contestation as to the exact numbers, we are in the millions of persons that have migrated as a result of forced reasons from rural mm -hmm. Colombia to urban life. Now, urban life isn't um, that quiet either. Mm -hmm. You can, we, we, we have cities that are very much segregated and set up along geographic barriers. So there's a certain part of Bogota uh, that is crossed sort of in, in the north part of, of the center, uh, from north from the center of town, that is generally considered to be that type of 
your regular city in all of Latin America. Mm -hmm. However, once you get outside of those areas, the things get very complicated. You have illegal ways of controlling every single economic activity. You have all kinds of informal ways of providing security. And again, illegal armed actors, drug trafficking, other forms of organized crime also affect mm -hmm. the lives of these individuals. So we also have a lot of intra-city displacement uh, where People in Medellin have to go from one commune to the other just because they do not get along with the particular. So there would seem to be an absolute control also in the city by the state authorities. However, that seems to be more an ideal than in practice. Um, unfortunately, the situation in the cities isn't that uh, great either. Mm -hmm. uh, our standards of poverty as well there's been a lot of debates of the changing numbers, but roughly we can say that there's 30% of the people that are affected by poverty. I would say that it's a lot greater. Uh, unemployment and subemployment is also much greater than recognized officially. And people are just doing their daily, their, their day in order to survive, just to make ends meet on a daily basis. Um, and it's about survival, and it's about survival in a very vicious, very violent, and very much led by enemy often. Mm -hmm. Again, that's the contradiction of Colombia. We have laws for everything. We have mm -hmm. you know, a debate on the new police code, then we have a debate on a law that resolves the problems of those people that have been forcibly displaced. At the same time, you have a law that tries to regulate all of urban action and all of urban life, but law just stays in the books. Law uh -huh. and practice really doesn't have that great of an effect. So why has the violence been going on for so long and who is in control today of Colombia? So the control undoubtedly is one of the state throughout the nation. However, there are, pay, 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 uh, there are places where that sovereignty uh, gets affected and where in fact armed groups such as the guerrilla groups, whether it's the Fuerzas Armadas Revolucionarias de Colombia, that's the armed forces, the, the revolutionary armed forces of Colombia known as the FARC, or the ELN do hold a lot of territory. So that's one dimension. And there, there's the discussion of the root causes of the conflict versus uh, other types of, of greed or grievances that, that might be present. There is another element of the conflict that though it does not explain its initiation and, and this source of violence, it does explain its perpetuation. Mm -hmm. And that is the e thriving illegal bonanzas and economic bonanzas, principally around illicit crops, particularly related to coca and mm -hmm. all that relates to narco trafficking. That has been something that has been present in Colombia since the 80s, separated from the armed conflict, but very quickly weaving into the armed conflict, making it to be very, very stable. I think the other reason why the armed conflict has gone on for so long is that the economy has stabilized uh, around that conflict. So one would expect that since there's a conflict, the economy is doing bad. However, the economy is not doing that bad. It continues to grow regularly. Growth rates, again, depending on who you look, are between 3.5 to 5 percent per year. That's not bad in a country that's facing uh, that type of conflict. And I think the other reason why it's perpetuated so much is because you can basically lead your life in Colombia as a middle class or working class citizen like nothing was going on outside. You go to work, you come back, you go to the malls, you go to the movies, you have your experience around the TV, you suffer you know, endless hours of traffic in, in these cities, mm -hmm. but it's the normal urban life. You can ignore what is happening. You could ignore the atrocity. There's an absolute separation and denial with the atrocity that goes on on a daily basis in Colombia as a result of the conflict. Okay, so how does transitional justice fit in to this situation? Um, first, let's talk about what transitional justice is and then what it actually will mean for Colombia. Well, the, the reason why transitional justice is being discussed currently in Colombia is principally because we're in a context of a peace negotiation. And that has been a situation that we haven't seen in quite a long time, especially we've never been at a point um, as we are now of really seeing peace negotiations between the insurgents and the government advance as much as they have been. Mm -hmm. So transitional justice has come into play. Now let's discuss what transitional justice is. Transitional justice is basically 
shorthand, and it's an unfortunate shorthand, but it's just caught on. Everybody talks about transitional justice without really knowing what it is. And it is shorthand for a series of processes and measures that promote the rule of law and justice in times of transition. Now, that's a mouthful. It's a lot easier to talk about transitional justice. Transitional justice is really not a type of justice. It's more a, a, a catchphrase that describes what took place in the 80s principally in the context of Latin America and the transitions from authoritarianism to democracies or in Eastern Europe as they were also transitioning out of the communist regime. In both of these places, societies very much pushed for truth, justice, and reparations as a way of dealing with the legacy of violations, as a way of promoting accountability, as a way of promoting justice, but also as a way of looking to the future, of making sure that you were able to turn the page. Now, in both of those contexts, in as much as you have a very clear successor regime that can look back and say, we want to get rid of the past, the past is bad, all these measures that were thought of as transitional justice, such as truth commissions, uh, special prosecutorial initiatives, vetting individuals from public administration, make sense. You're trying to make a clear break from the past in order to get to a more promising future and consolidate this new promise of democracy. Mm -hmm. So that's where transitional justice comes from. That's where the expression comes from. Um, I think the best definition that I can provide is more descriptive, and it comes from the UN uh, Secretary General report back in 2004, where he says that transitional justice is basically a shorthand in order to demonstrate the type of promotion of justice and promotion of rule of law through mechanisms and processes associated with a society that wants to deal with the past mm -hmm. in order to serve justice further accountability, and achieve reconciliation. Now, those mechanisms can be of many types, and basically what he does is he lists some, making sure that it is not an exclusive list, but rather one of examples of things that have popped up, mm -hmm. such as, again, truth commissions, special prosecutorial initiatives, vetting processes, institutional reform, um, and reparations for victims. Mm -hmm. We have not yet identified all the tools that are available, they're very much context specific and context sensitive. Mm -hmm. Transitional justice is largely a social, cultural, and political move to press for justice in times of transition. Mm -hmm. um, and so, that's why we're at this situation. So who actually are the players overseeing the transitional justice process? I mean, I know there's many different mm -hmm. factions there. How do mm -hmm. they all work together? I mean, so, I would imagine you wouldn't want some of the people who are participating. Of course. So the context right now, since it is about the peace negotiations, you have one discussion that relates to what type of justice measures will be adopted after a peace deal is reached. Mm -hmm. And that presently is a very confidential uh, scenario where both government and guerrilla are discussing about these measures. Now, as you can imagine, both of these actors have a lot to hide. They, in fact, have been part of the atrocity. They are, they are the ones that are responsible for the atrocities perpetrated. And they, of course, want to probably provide mutual impunity for each other. Um, they have been very good at voicing the proper words to the public and saying we're not going to reach agreements that, in, that implicate mutual impunities. We're not going to give each other amnesties. However, uh, in fact, both of them have a huge tendency to try to adopt a highly politicized sense of justice, a, a, a type of justice that is devaluated, let's say a softer light justice, to get on with, um, with the future mm -hmm. and ignore the past. Now, the other sectors that come in and that have been very prevalent in Colombia for a very long time are grassroots movements, victims groups, and mm -hmm. human rights organizations. And these organizations for decades have been demanding truth, justice, and reparations. As a human rights movement, it concentrated principally around uh, state actors, basically all the repression that took place by the military and by the police throughout the 70s, throughout the 80s, throughout the 90s, and throughout the armed conflict. Um, 
maybe towards the end of the 90s and, and the first decades of, of, of this century, we do start seeing victims of the guerrilla um, arise and also demand truth, justice, and reparations. I think principally linked to the issue of kidnapping. The guerrilla uh, did have a policy and a practice of kidnapping certain individuals. Um, even if they say it's not a policy, without a doubt, there was systematic use of kidnapping and eventual killings by these guerrillas. So that group of victims is also demanding truth, justice, and reparations. So that's another very different voice. Now, outside of those two, you also have other sectors of society that are not interested in uncovering the past, basically because there has been links and organizational links to institutional type violence. Mm -hmm. um, there is a lot of illegality in Colombia that if we start uncovering atrocity, we're probably going to get also to get two issues of corruption, and we're going to get to links of very prestigious elite economic and local elite tied into the logic and to the dynamic of violence. They too are interested in not having a great say so. Mm -hmm. So we're at a moment of huge tension. It's a political moment where those wielding the power probably want a soft sense or a soft type of justice. Mm -hmm. And the victims are demanding for as much justice, sure. truth, and reparations right. as they can get. So how do you think things will play out? I mean, do you think Colombia does have a chance for peace? And, you know, what will that mean in terms of transitional justice, how things play out for Colombia? So I do hope that the negotiation leads to the ending of the conflict. Mm -hmm. That will be very, very important in as much as it gets rid of this enemy type logic that has polarized Colombia. It will also get rid of the insurgency, counterinsurgency paradigm that has led political debates in Colombia for a very long time. As far as peace is concerned, I think by ending the conflict, we're finally at a stage where we start building peace. What that looks like is not about the peace settlement between guerrillas and the government. Building peace will have to implicate all political forces, all private parties in Colombia at the different levels. So starting with a huge national pact that is inclusionary, that ratifies again the rules and the institutions of democracies so that violence is no longer part of political life. Mm -hmm. That ratifies again the, the, the basic rules and institutions of economy where we do get rid of corruption and other forms of illicit um, uh, mechanisms of exploiting um, the economy in Colombia. But then we need to get to the local level, and that is, what does the state look like at the local level? What do the people that have been abandoned, marginalized, that have been mostly affected by conflict, want from the state, and what can the state do there? Mm -hmm. It's a lot easier said than done. It's a lot easier to think of an ideal total state that will reach everybody and start providing truth, that it will start providing health, education. Mm -hmm. Um, we're talking about a country that needs to be developed in infrastructure uh, and its uh, electrical network. Uh, it needs to d develop schools. And again, all these people that have been excluded need to be brought in as citizens. So I think we're just beginning. It is hopeful without a doubt, but we're just beginning that process of understanding that our political spectrum needs to widen, that tolerance and respect for dissent needs to take place in such a way that violence isn't the way to resolve it, mm -hmm. and that Colombia needs to incorporate populations that have been marginalized. Then we get to the very uncomfortable situation of how are we going to deal with our legacy of atrocity? Mm -hmm. How much truth, how much justice, and how much reparations? There's a tendency that says, well, we need to be pragmatic and political about it, so it's as much truth and justice as the system can um, handle. Uh, I think that's a bad formula, and I really think that it needs to be enough truth and justice to really get to denial and very much face the regime of atrocity that has taken over all, for, all sorts of public and private life in Colombia. Mm -hmm. uh, these are uncomfortable truths. They, they will implicate generals. They will implicate very powerful politicians. Uh, they will implicate uh, very important cattlemen, for example. Um, and this is uh, probably one of the most trying and most difficult times. There is still some time to go. Again, we're still at the negotiation phase. There's a lot of spoilers um, that, are, that are taking place. But it does seem that the society as a whole is getting ready for these very big debates mm -hmm. of assuming that strategic decisions, meaning what, 
What do we want Colombia to look like in the future? Is it possible to think of a Colombia after so many decades of mm -hmm. conflict right. without the conflict? And I think if society gets involved in these greater debates uh, uh, about um, the ends that we're looking for as a mm -hmm. result of the peace process, um, news might be hopeful in a couple of years. Wow, that's, uh, that would be remarkable. Thank you so much for being here with us today and sharing some of your work. Oh, thank you very much. For more information about Professor Reed Hurtado and his research, please visit our website at yale.edu slash Macmillan Report. Be sure to join us again for another episode of the Macmillan Report, made possible through funding from the Whitney and Betty Macmillan Center for International and Area Studies at Yale.